Since the dawn of time, man has been curious. And for almost as long, the Vibes Broadcast Network has sought the truth. Investigate. Discuss. Explore. Okay. Maybe in other episodes, but this one is just... Listen to the Vibes. The views and opinions of our guests may not necessarily reflect those of the host or the Vibes Broadcast Network. Listener discretion is advised. Welcome, everyone, to another episode of Listen to the Vibes. And I have here Mr. Frank King. He is a comedian. And we've had a great conversation before the show started. But uh, (laughs) we're going to see if we can continue it. Um, You do a lot in uh, suicide prevention. So tell me how you got involved in that. Well, how far do you want to go back? Man, you know what? You want to start from the day you were born and go from there? We can do that. Yeah, people say to me, were you born funny? Oh, yeah. As a matter of fact, an amusing thing happened on the way down the birth canal. (laughs) Uh, No, fourth grade. I told my first joke. The kids laughed. The teacher was hysterical. And at that moment, I made up my mind, I am going to be a stand-up comedian. In 12th grade, I'd taken three years of drama in high school. I'd never gotten a part with a, you know, with a line to speak. I'd always been in the chorus. And I'm not, you know, I'm not that bright, but I thought there's a pattern here. Uh, so I thought if I do stand up, I can write, direct, produce, and star my own little show every night. And there was a talent show last semester, senior year. Mm-hmm. And it turns out nobody had ever done stand up. So I thought, so I wrote you know, sort of a high school about sneaking out to lunch and, you know, high school stuff. And I won. And I went home, told my mama, who's big on education, by the way, I'm going to be a stand up comedian. She goes, son, you're going to college first. I don't care what you do when you get done. You can be a goat herder for all I care, but you're going to be a goat herder with a college degree. So I went to UNC Chapel Hill, got a couple of degrees. And, and you know, she's probably right. A good liberal arts education never hurt anybody. So moved to San Diego with my high school sweetheart, who's also my college sweetheart uh, and my first wife. And by chance in San Diego, in a little town next to San Diego called La Jolla, there's a branch of the comedy store, the famous one up on Sunset, and they had an open mic night. And so I went to open mic night. I mean, I was drawn there like a magnet. And I'm on stage halfway through my first five minutes, and I heard a voice inside my head say, you're home. And then I thought, I'm going to do this for a living, really. I have no idea how. (laughs) And I thought about writing a keynote called, what could you do if you didn't know no better? Because I didn't know no better how hard it was to make a living full time on stand up comedy. And I've been doing it full time and speaking for 35 years. But it, it's a it's a pull. I mean, it's a difficult road to hoe. So then went on the road day after Christmas, 1985. In December of that year, I asked my girlfriend, now my second wife of 35 years, do you want to come on the road with me? Just come along for the ride. And I figured she'd go, oh, hell no. And she goes, Yeah. So we gave up our jobs. The apartment jumped into my tiny little Dodge Colt, and we were on the road for 2,629 nights in a row nonstop. Wow. Yep, seven years and change. Beer bars, pool halls, drunk idiots screaming, tell us some jokes we can dance to. (laughs) Here comes a slow one, you can slow dance. Yeah. Did a little radio after that. Uh, I got I got hired by the number one morning show in Raleigh, North Carolina, my old hometown, because back in the mid 90s, they were hiring comics to do, you know, be the co-host or the sidekick on morning radio. Mm-hmm. And and I, I took a number one morning show and drove it to number six in 18 months. And a friend of mine said, you didn't just drive it into the ground. You drove it into Middle Earth, which I did. And when I got done, the comedy club boom had busted. But my act was very clean. So I thought I could do corporate comedy after dinner, after lunch, the rubber chicken start. So I did that till the 2007-ish, and then the recession hit. And speaking and comedy dropped off about 80%, and my wife and I lost everything we worked for in a mm-hmm. Chapter 7 bankruptcy. And that's when I learned what the barrel of my gun tasted like, literally. Uh, spoiler alert, I did not pull the trigger. I say that in my keynote. And a friend of mine came up afterwards one day and he goes, hey, man, how come you didn't pull the trigger? I go, hey, man, could you try to sound slightly less disappointed? <laughs> so when, I, when the recession ended and they started, you know, conferences kicked off again, 
the meeting planners, the speakers bureau said, right, we love you. We just, we can't pay you that kind of money anymore. Just to be funny, you have to teach our audience something. You gotta have some, have some learning outcomes. And I thought, what in the world? And uh, I read a book by a friend of mine called The Message of You, Turn Your Life into a Money-Making Speaking Career. And I went into it thinking I got nothing, but halfway through, I thought, wait a minute. Depression and suicide run in my family. More nuts in my family than in a squirrel turd. And I've had this close call. If I get some training and certification in suicide prevention, I could keynote on suicide prevention. So I did. And then the second hurdle was I've been a comic for 25 years. Everybody just thinks of me as a funny guy. I need to go from being a funny speaker to a speaker who's funny. So my wife said, do a TED talk. I said, what's a TED talk? She said, it's a it, TEDx actually, it's local. TED's the big one in Vancouver, BC once a year, but TEDx is local. So just by chance, I got an application invite in the mail that week, email. I filled it out, sent it in and I got the TEDx. And I, I did a, a TEDx on suicide prevention. I came out on stage for the first time ever, out loud that I was living with depression and thoughts of suicide. Nobody knew, my family, my wife, my friends, came out in that talk. And that allowed me to rebrand or begin to rebrand. Mm -hmm. And I've done six TEDx talks total, all on one aspect of mental health or the other, which is, is you know, each one strengthens my brand as the mental health comedian. And then I was doing other speeches from 2014 to 2018, I have, a, I have a networking speech, a motivational speech. And I decided January 1st, 2018, I was just gonna pick a lane. I was just gonna be a suicide prevention speaker. And that's made all the difference. I selected six of the top 10 at-risk occupations in the US for suicide. Those are the only people I market to. So, um, you know, you pick a lane and you pick your ideal clients. And again, that's made a big difference uh, and not just being another speaker doing motivational speaking or whatever. So it's, um, and sometimes people come looking for me. <laughs> they go, you're a comedian and you talk about suicide? Yeah. Yeah. If I, <laughs> hey, listen, if I had known how much money there was in being crazy earlier, I would have started doing that long before I did. Uh, I should be a millionaire by now. Exactly. <laughs> So that's how I that's how I got into from comedy to speaking and speaking to TEDx and now I coach TEDx people people started coming to me and asking me you know you got six TEDx talks can you teach me I said sure and a friend of mine who's a business coach we we're having a conversation one day she goes hey man listen I know you're teaching people how to get a TEDx for free and that's got to stop I said okay she goes I, I got a friend that he'll build your website for like fifteen hundred bucks and you need to start charging for that. Mm -hmm. And it worked out really well because that was just before the pandemic. And another friend of mine in March of 2020 said, Frank, I know you got some clients paid for TEDx. I think you should put all your marketing efforts there. Because who knows when live, live engagements are coming back? Yeah. Another great piece of advice. So now I have a couple of dozen clients. I've got three or four dozen have at least one TEDx. Some have two, one has three. So that saved our bacon during the during the pandemic was uh, coaching the TEDx. So that that's pretty much uh, brings us right up to today. Yeah, you know, I've talked to several people that even though the pandemic, you know, it wiped out them going to clubs and everything, they got into doing similar stuff to what you're doing. Well, they'll, you know, not necessarily for mental health, but they go in and they, they do all kinds of stuff for CEOs and companies and what have you. and and uh and then i do have some friends that have got into just getting on youtube and other platforms and doing videos doing their comedy that way i mean we tried to to do a facebook live and see if we get people to to give money but they they enjoy the jokes but not enough to give money for it <laughs> yeah well and i tell you what the silver lining for speakers is is that now everybody's used to virtual so mm -hmm. I was, I was in, um, let's see, where was I? Someplace recently, I was in Texas and I had a um, one to 2 p.m. Central time keynote for a big energy association in Plano. And then that afternoon at four o'clock central, I had an hour long, uh, hour long virtual keynote for NASA, for the John F. Kennedy Space Center. Oh, wow. Suicide prevention in aerospace. 
So the, I mean, that's a twofer and I, I did it from my hotel room. So I mean, that's the silver lining is you're not quite so tied to the time zones and flight schedules and, you know. With the JFK one, that's in Florida, right? Yep. And I was in Texas and they said, well, virtual's fine. Yes. So to sent you down to Friendswood, you could have been in the NASA there in Houston. Yes. Uh, and a friend who lives in Alabama works for NASA and I sent him the link so he could watch because they had a public link for the, uh... <laughs> oh, and to get this, we're getting ready to start. And she goes T minus five. And I go, wait a minute. You guys really say T minus. <laughs> hey you know gotta send them into space somehow hey and i was old enough to remember when neil walked on the moon i we were, we were coming back from myrtle beach in uh, an old chevrolet malibu no air conditioning windows down and they had a radio on and you know one giant you know one small step for man a friend of mine's got a joke i can't give you the actual punchline because it's it's a little it's profane a, but is it a little raunchy yes but i'll give you <laughs> the feeling for it he goes, you know, one, one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind is good. But think about this. Neil Armstrong is the first man on the moon. I, he said, if it had been me, I'm not sure I could have resisted. <laughs> All right, I'm getting ready to set my foot on the, I'm on the moon. <laughs> Neil, Neil, calm down. Oh, but I'm on the moon. <laughs> I mean, wouldn't you be tempted to, I'm the first man on the moon. Oh, that would be me. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'm on Neil, the, the world is listening. I don't I'm care. on the flipping moon. <laughs> I'm on the flipping moon. <laughs> yeah. Oh man. So um now you you um got certified in, in suicide prevention. Yep. Um yeah, I've I've had several people on here talking about the subject. Uh myself, I lived with depression since i was about 12 so you're talking good 40 years mm -hmm. um what what do you do to to help people i mean what what is your message other than just comedy to to help them because i mean even me as po positive as i try to be there are those moments where it creeps back in my head and and i have everything to live for but it still oh, yeah. doesn't seem like enough not situational no, I've been most depressed at some of the best times in my life. So it's not for me and perhaps you, it's not generally situational. Uh, there were a lot of people who were depressed for the first time during the pandemic and that situation yeah. because of the uncertainty. Well, what I, what I teach the audience is the good news is eight out of 10 people who are suicidal are ambivalent. They can't make up their mind. Nine out of 10 give hints in the last seven days leading up to an attempt. Mm -hmm. which means the vast majority of people want to be saved. And that means we can save the vast majority of people. The trick is how do you spot depression and thoughts of suicide? And what do you say? What don't you say? What do you do? What don't you do? And how do you find resources? And that's what I teach. I teach the signs, just a handful of signs of depression and then mm -hmm. thoughts of suicide. And then how, how to handle that. If you realize, Oh Lord, they're depressed and suicidal. So, that's the heart of my message is again, the good news is we can say it's the most preventable cause of death on the planet. You don't have to be a clinician to stop suicide. You just have to know what you're listening and looking for and what to say. And if you'd like to go over the, the signs and symptoms, we can, and what to say, what to do. Oh, definitely. Definitely. Okay. Cause uh, you know, there there's, there's folks that um, they're okay. They're like when you have a, uh, a woman that's in an abusive relationship, and she doesn't want to leave. She knows what to expect from day to day to day. Um, when you're in one of those relationships where things are going great, that seems like when you're the most worried, it's, when's this going to fall apart? Yeah, that's so when you're when you're struggling all the time, you're you're expecting that struggle from day to day, and then all of a sudden you start to get the, a little bit of success then it becomes scary and it sounds weird, but when people get to that point, it freaks them out and they don't know how to handle it. And those thoughts of suicide come into their head. Sure. This can't last. Right. Right. Well, depression, here's a couple three signs. Somebody mm -hmm. may be depressed. Uh, they eat too much or they can't eat. They sleep too much or they can't get any sleep. Um, they have trouble getting out of bed in the morning. 
maybe getting to work on time, but seemed to rally in the afternoon like an entirely different person. Uh, here's a big one, and the one you can spot on Zoom. They let their personal hygiene go. You know, usually when they zoom in, they're pretty well put together. But this day, you know, hair's a little dirty, clothes aren't quite so clean. It may be because they're having trouble getting out of bed in the morning to run a load of wash and take a shower. So what do you say to somebody like that where you suspect? Well, here's what you don't say. Pull yourself up by your bootstraps. Turn that frown upside down. Have you tried joy? The guy who said that to me, I said, unless you're talking about dishwashing liquid, I don't think it's going to work. Uh, here's what you do say to somebody who thinks depressed. I'm here for you and I mean it. I know you're not lazy or crazy or self-absorbed. I know that, men, that depression is a mental illness. Here's the good news. With time and treatment, things will get better. I will take the time. I'll help you get the treatment. And here's the big one. You have to ask them flat out, just like this, are you having thoughts of suicide? Just like that. If you can't ask that, find somebody who can, or I'll give you my phone number. I'll ask them if you suspect they're having thoughts of suicide. Because, you know, oftentimes people won't tell you. So how can you spot the signs of suicidal thoughts without them telling you? Well, they um, talk about death and dying. They're Googling death and dying. Death and dying appears as a theme in their artwork, their music, their writing. Here's a big one. Getting their affairs in order. Especially if they're giving away prized possessions because they want to make sure those go to the people that they want them to go to when they're gone. Accumulating the means, either stockpiling medications or buying a firearm. Women attempt suicide three times as many times as men. Men tend to complete because they use a firearm. Here's one that's counterintuitive and extremely dangerous. They've been depressed forever and now they're happy and for no apparent reason. And you're happy because thank God finally they're happy. The problem is they're happy because perhaps they've chosen time, place, and method and they know the pain is coming to an end. What a lot of people don't realize about suicide, it's not so much about wanting to kill yourself as it is ending the pain. So you got to be very careful, you know, if they're going around, you know, you, I, I hadn't seen him in weeks, he came by, you know, and I was just down in, in Tennessee, at uh, Tennessee Westland, and a young man had died by suicide two weeks before. And I was with a group of his friends after my presentation, and they each one had seen him the week before he did it. And they hadn't seen him before that point in quite some time. So he was obviously going around taking care of unfinished business, telling them how much he cared about them, gave his aunt a big hug, told her he loved her, and he wasn't a big hugging kind of guy. So they call that the tyranny of hindsight. Looking back, you realize that's what was going on. All right. What don't you say when somebody tells you they are suicidal? You're being melodramatic. Nobody who talks about it ever does it. You're just looking for attention. Here's what you do say. Do you have a plan? And if they have a plan, what is your plan? And if it's detailed to time, place, and method, you need to, if they'll let you, take them to a mental health facility. If not, call the Suicide Prevention Lifeline. Or now there's a text line for younger people. You text the word HELP to 741741. Hmm. Now let's say the, yep, text the word HELP or connect or anything to 741741 and somebody about their age will respond. Because apparently people, younger people are more forthcoming about their emotions in texts. Now let's say they are suicidal, but don't have a really detailed plan. And this isn't in any course I've ever taken. I just came up with this with a friend who's a psychiatrist. I would ask them, okay, are you going to kill yourself? And if they say no, then you say, okay, tell me why not make them give voice to whatever's keeping them here because something is keeping them here. And if you can figure out what that is, they call that a turning point in mental health. You can latch on to that. Then, okay, well, listen, what do you say? Will, will you allow me to help you come up with a plan to keep you safe just for today? So no long-term commitments. No, don't kill yourself. Just will you let me help you come up with a plan to keep you safe today? So that, that's the protocol. Man, I, I wish that I had that kind of information years ago because it's it's hit close to home i mean i've tried at least three times myself whoa uh my father was successful and then three years later my little brother was successful uh within that next year uh one of my best friends was very successful at it and 
it's been it's been hell <laughs> to try to figure out why am I still here when I was like these well my dad uh, that's a different story but my brother and my my friend I mean they were there for me all the time and they were wonderful people and I'm like I'm a jackass why am I still here and they're gone <laughs> that's right you know yeah they're much better people than I am why but you know now I have grandkids and all I have to do is think about them and what would it do to them and then the thought goes away but well it still creeps up on me from time to time oh yeah and something you should know and your audience should know people say it's a selfish act to die by suicide and from the outside looking in it is but from the inside looking out, oftentimes the person who's suicidal has something called burdensomeness, meaning I felt this way. A lot of people feel this way. The world would be better off without me. So they are actually thinking about the people they're leaving behind and thinking they'd all be better if I were gone. So from the inside, it's a selfless act. From the outside, obviously a selfish act. So they are thinking about their loved ones. Generally, they just think they'd be better off without them. Irrational thought, by the way, but still that's that's the thinking process yeah um i just can't imagine putting my children or my grandchildren through the same pain that i've gone through and you know i i didn't i didn't let myself feel that's the problem i immediately drowned myself with alcohol and drugs especially cocaine and for the longest time that's that's all i did and i didn't go through the emotions that i should have and i think that's another burdening factor that you know makes me think well you know uh, uh, i don't know survivor's remorse i guess <laughs> yes well and again um i was on a working a cruise ship and a guy came up to me after my show and asked if i did anything besides cruise comedy and i said yeah I speak on suicide prevention and every day on the ship there's a friends of bill meeting and he said to me, Frank, do you know the connection between substance abuse disorder and suicide? I said, well, I know the obvious. He goes, but what's the real connection? And I said, I don't know. He goes, suicide, end the pain. Substance abuse disorder, end or dull the pain, at least temporarily. It's all about pain, he said. That's so. for sure. It, you, get, you get tired of it because it's emotional pain. Um, then I know there's other people out there that deal with the same things that I do. I, I have a, um, a degenerative disease in my spine, which causes physical pain and you get tired of it. You know, you go from doctor to doctor to doctor and they want to give you pain pills, but you know, that's temporary relief. You're talking maybe 30 minutes tops that you get any kind of relief. And, you know, I, I know there's folks going through things like cancer and, and other, you know, rheumatoid arthritis. I mean, you name it, there's all kinds of pains out there. You get fed up. It's like, why, sure. why should I keep going? I'm, I'm mentally, I'm not good. Physically, I'm not good. Yeah. Well, chronic pain is a, is a, is a cause of depression. Um, insomnia, same thing. Cause uh, of depression. <laughs> well, it's why bother? Why go on? What's the point? Yeah, um, that that's why I, I appreciate when someone like you comes on that you have a different perspective than some other people that I have on. And there's that because it, it, not everybody thinks the same. Mm -mm. Something's going to, to to resonate with someone. And, well, uh, let's talk know. about that for a second. I have a condition called chronic suicidal ideation. OK, which is not in the DSM five, I don't think, or six yet. It means chronic suicidal ideation means for me and people in my tribe, the option of suicide is always on the menu as a solution for problems large and small. And when I say small, a couple of years ago, my car broke down. I had three thoughts, get it fixed, buy a new one, or I could just kill myself. People in the audience laugh and I go, here's the deal. Every time I've spoken since 2014, there has been one person in the audience, at least sometimes more, who has chronic suicidal ideation. And invariably, they do not know it has a name. They think they're just some kind of freak and completely alone. Had a young woman come up at a college show. She goes, thanks for your keynote. I said, you're welcome. She said, but I got to tell you, it made me weep. How did it make you weep? She goes, you know your story about the car? Get it fixed, buy a new one, kill yourself. I go, yeah. She goes, I've been having those thoughts all my life. I had no idea it had a name. 
I thought I was just some kind of freak and completely alone. And when you said that out loud, I realized for the first time in my life that I am not in fact alone and I wept. That's the power of starting the conversation on mental health and suicide. And so you, you hit right home with me because I've had those thoughts too. Uh, I can't make the payments next, next week. You know what? I either, I, I figure this out and get the money or I just end it. Yeah. Well, here's the, here's the power in that, by the way. And it's ironic. I'll tell you up front because I have made the decision. I can kill myself anytime I like. Uh, and, and, and if, if my premise is correct, that the suicide is, is about pain, ending the pain because I'm in control and I can end the pain anytime I want, I can stand a great deal more pain knowing I can bring it to an end. So ironically, my chronic suicidal ideation keeps me alive. Man. Well, you know, another thing I think of is, you know, I'm supposed to be the man of the house. Um, you know, basically I'm the head of the patriarchy in our family yeah. now, because my dad's not here. Both my grandfathers are gone. You know, they don't, I don't have uncles that, you know, can take that spot. So I am, I am in charge basically. Right. And so I have to be stronger to, to, you know, take on the, the family problems. <laughs> like you picked the wrong guy for this job. Yeah, that's right. I, I kind yeah. of fell into it. <laughs> Not the way I wanted to. Yeah. But... Hey, listen, you need to call a zip recruiter and see if they haven't got somebody who's <laughs> better. Right. <laughs> you know, there's got to be reasons other than my my family. There's got to be something I could tell myself, you know, hey, I'm not so bad, but it's hard to do that. Oh, yeah. Well, I, you know, people ask me, they ask me, are you going to kill yourself? No, uh, because I, I feel sort of like um, George Bailey and It's a Wonderful Life. Mm -hmm. As these people come up to me and, and I enlighten them that it's a thing and there are lots of us and they're relieved, maybe steered them far enough off the path to suicide, they'll live a normal life. And I feel like if, if I were to kill myself, then I would invariably take some of those people with me who never got a chance to hear me say that out loud. And by the way, that, that came from an AA friend. A friend of mine's father was an AA for 20 years. And somebody asked him if he was ever going to drink again. And he said, no. And they said, how, how can you be so sure? He said, because of all the people I have sponsored and all the people I will sponsor, if I dived back into that bottle, a goodly number of them would follow me in. So that kept him sober. Well, I just don't want my kids to break up my kiss collection. <laughs> yeah, well, there are worse things. Uh, hey, I had to think of something. Yeah, that's right. I guess. They're going to fight over my comic books. That's what it is. That's what it is. I've got an original. <laughs> I, I do have some originals, uh, but yeah, no, seriously. Uh, that it's very important to find something just like you yeah. said, if it, if it means that you're going to be there to stop somebody else from doing the same thing, you know, think about somebody else. Yeah. I, I give my cell phone number out every time I speak. Dude. And I say, look, if you're suicidal, call the hotline. If you are just having a bad day, call a crazy person. Here's my cell. And you know, people call people text, not, not frequently, but they do. And, you know, they're looking for help for themselves or resources for others. You know, just somebody to reach out to who doesn't, there's no judgment. Don't have to explain anything. I get it. I hear the same music. They do. You know, as a friend of mine says, uh, uh, can I use, can I say BS? Can I say the whole, uh, the two words there? With the go, sure, along go for okay. it. She goes, yeah, Frank, all you're doing is you're just, you know, you, they call you and you wade through whatever bullshit they're wading through with them. That's your job. And so that's, that's my job, just to wade through that bullshit with them. You know, somebody who's not going to judge. Somebody's just going, oh, good God. Oh, my Lord. How'd you make it? Oh, man. Yeah. Not going to suggest anything. Not going to, you know, as we say in the mental health business, not going to should all over them. You should do this. And you should do that. Nope. Just yeah. here to listen. You get tired of hearing all that kind of stuff. But I have to say, uh, you, you've made me think that 
this show is just as much for me as it is for the other people that I'm trying to help out sure. there. So same with my keynotes. It's very therapeutic. Yeah. People ask me, does it trigger you to tell your story over and over? No, you, you missed the point. Telling it and, and starting the conversation, breaking the silence and the stigma is yeah. very therapeutic for me. Well, you, you change the story when you, when you tell it like you tell it. It used to be a, a tragedy, and now you've turned it into a triumph and a help for other people. Yeah. So the, 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 the way you're telling the story is different. Yeah, it's, it's sort of a it's sort of the AA model. You know, you you get well or better, and you know you you're you're still sober, and you share your story to help others. Yeah. Uh, well, I've I've talked to uh, people that they they try to train people to to think more positively, and and uh, you know talked about tapping, and and somebody told me quit telling that the story the same way every time. You need to change the way you tell it. And I'm like, what? You know, because there's things that happened to me when I was a kid and I focused on the bad stuff that was happening when you kind of look at it like you're outside and you're telling the story of someone else. Yeah. But there was a there was a triumph out of it. Then you, you changed everything. It's like that law of attraction. You know, you, you change that way of thinking. And now, instead of bringing the, that tragedy over and over again, you're bringing a triumph. Well, and because people have a pretty solid idea in their minds what mental illness looks and sound like, sounds like. And, you know, I wrote jokes for Leno for 20 years. I've been doing stand-up and speaking for 35. And I'm not what most people think of as mentally ill. <laughs> so you change perceptions. You can change prejudices, you know, and perhaps reduce the stigma. You know, it's, it's hard for them to hold the thought of what they, you know, the guy on the corner with a will work for food. That's kind of what they think of with mental illness mm -hmm. and a comedian on stage, you know, so it's, it's, I'm just trying to change their perceptions. Look at Robin Williams. Who would have ever thought? Yep. I suspected given his, you know, he was man, he was a little manic, uh, brilliant. And that's another thing. A lot of my friends who are high functioning mentally ill have some other superpower, you know, a uh, great performer, writer, comedian, you know, artist of some kind. Um, same brain. As a matter of fact, I don't, I, in my third TEDx talk, I said, look, I don't think I'm broken. I think I was made this way because I believe my depression and thoughts of suicide are simply the flip side of my creativity and imagination. Same brain, same wiring. There's a reason my brain processes, you know, ordinary speech into comedy in a flash. People so ask me, can't. go ahead. No, you was going to say you were made more like Chitty Chitty Bang Bang instead of Kit, right? <laughs> well, there's a reason when somebody heckles me that I could fire off something that I didn't even, I didn't consciously think of. It just came out. People go, how'd you think that up? I didn't think it up. When I heard it, you heard it. A woman <laughs> yelled at me as she's leaving a club one night. She'd gotten really drunk down front. I finally signaled security to throw her out. She's disturbing everybody. On her way out the door, she turns back to me. She goes, F you. And without missing a beat, I looked at her and I said, not even for practice. <laughs> Standing ovation. <laughs> and people were like, how'd you think? I didn't think it up. It just came out of my brain. I have no idea where it came from, how it came from. <laughs> but that's the wiring. That's the way my brain works. See, so. I couldn't I couldn't do stand up like y'all do. I don't have that kind of talent. I can be funny around the house, you know, and make, you know, good, but I, you know, I know them well enough to know what makes them laugh, sure. but I come up with stuff like that off the top of my head, but I don't know about being on stage. I don't think I could do it. <laughs> well, you know, I, my sister's funny. My mom and dad were both funny. We were in addition to being, you know, nutty, all of us in the family are funny. Uh, and so it's, you know, I came by when I told my, when I meet somebody that was my mom's contemporary, what are you doing for a living? Stand up comedy that figures, you know, so she was very witty. <laughs> okay. You, you have to leave us with a joke. Oh, let me, let me give you a true story. A funny, true story. I sure. Think. Go for it. As somebody with mental illness and perhaps you'll appreciate this. I get tired oftentimes when somebody says, how you're doing, how you doing? I get tired of going, fine, living the dream, another day in paradise. Sometimes I just want to tell them, especially if they're neurotypical. 
And especially if I'm tired and, you know, the editor has gone to sleep in my head. So I did two, three hours, suicide prevention, continuing education programs back to back on my feet, talking for six hours. Mm -hmm. I get in the Uber, nice young man. Our eyes lock in the rearview mirror. He goes, man, how you doing? I thought, I'm going to tell him. I said, I'm depressed and suicidal. How about you? <laughs> he freezes. He goes, what am I supposed to say to that? I said, do you really want to know? He goes, yeah. I said, you're supposed to ask me if I have a plan. And so he thinks about it. He goes, again, our eyes are locked in the rearview mirror. Car hadn't moved yet. He goes, do you have a plan? And then it hits him. And he turns to me and he goes, does it involve Uber? <laughs> I said, man, that is brilliant. That is, I'm, I'm going to be telling that story forever. <laughs> now, uh, what, what's your website? The... Mental health comedian, or as you know, folks like us from the South would say, the mental health comedian.com. And what about social media? Yeah, it's all the mental health comedian. Okay. Yeah, and you then can type in the mental health comedian or mental health comedian, you'll find me. It's, uh, it's my brand. Well, I want to put that in the description so people can click on it, go to it, and, yep. uh, and follow you. And uh, if there's anyone out there that uh, you might be able to, Give this guy a job to come talk to your folks. Hey, yeah, we got to keep yeah, him going. As you know, I'm uh, I'm easy, but I'm not cheap. I want you guys to know that. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's That's well, what there, she said. Yes, yeah, <laughs> she's not loose. She's just user friendly. Bless her heart. Um, the if you go to my website, the mental health comedian, two co-authors and I have written four books okay. on men's mental health, and the first book's available. For Put an email address in on the mental health comedian and you can download the MP3 unabridged and I narrate the first book. So absolutely free. Well, thank you. I appreciate yeah. that. Um, yeah. you have anything else going on, man? Let me know. I'll be glad to to have either have you back on or help promote it. Well, you know, I told you I'm gonna be doing dry bar comedy on April 29th in Salt Lake City. I, wait, no, not Salt Lake. Is it Provo? I guess I'll be in Provo, Utah at a comedy club doing doing my episode of uh of a dry bar comedy. I must have some kind of connection because I've had several different comedians that do dry bar comedy and uh, I, I subscribe to that channel and I enjoy it. It took me five tries to get really? it. It was killing me. Yeah, cause I, there were some guys that I knew that weren't near as funny as I am. And I'm like, how come I, but a friend of mine who got it, I asked him how he got it. And he goes, well, this fella, Tim, Grable got it for me. And I said, I know Tim. He said, well, you know, email him, ask him if he'll submit you. He did. And I got it. So this is the only way we're going to get this guy to quit contacting us is just quit and put him on. <laughs> yeah. Put him on for God. And I got to run all my material, not all my material. So, you know, if it's on the edge, I got to run it by him. Like I got to run by um, my first wife, wonderful woman. They don't allow you to run down your spouse, by the way, on the show. And I never do anyway. I said, look, she's my high school sweetheart. She's my college sweetheart. I mean, she's a wonderful woman. We got married. The problem is we had nothing in common. But you know what they say. Opposite to track. She was pregnant. I wasn't. So <laughs> I got to run. I got to run that by the guy in Provo to make sure, you know, that that's going to fly. Because, <clears throat> you, you know, can't tell. And. <laughs> You know, nowadays, everybody gets offended by everything. They forgot what comedy is supposed to be. It's supposed to be offensive. It's supposed to yeah. make you think. And, you know, one, one thing I know we're, we're going to end, but I, I do have to say this. Yeah. We have to learn to be able to laugh at ourselves. Um, I always felt like I knew the people who liked me at work because they were the ones that picked on me. The ones yeah. that ignored me or the ones that didn't like me. And we could make fun of each other. We could make fun of each other's race. We could do all that. And nobody got offended by it. But now you can't make even the slightest bit of comedy without somebody losing their mind. It's, you've lost the whole purpose behind it. You've had yeah. comedians like Lenny Bruce. Oh, my God. Uh, George Carlin, Richard Pryor. I mean, we were watching Richard Pryor the other night, and I'm like, good God, you couldn't get away with this nowadays. Carlin, famously, because I've listened to uh, 
Bill Maher, I think, is the show, and he was talking about Carlin and how Carlin used to be, he used to wear a button down collar, tie, and a jacket when he did the Tonight Show. And then he let his hair down, he became the hippie dippy weatherman or whatever. And he said back then, I need to do, he said to his manager, I need to do colleges. I need to go places where the, the kids have an open mind. <laughs> how far have we come? Yeah. Where yeah, colleges yeah. is one of the worst places for comics. I just, and when I, when I started comedy as a comedian, it's just on stage, it's just you and the First Amendment. That's it. And if you don't like the show, go back to the box office, get your money back. You know, it's a passive medium. Nobody changed you to the chair. If you hate it, go to the box office, tell me you want your money back and leave. That's mm -hmm. what I think it should be. I mean, I don't, I don't approve of everybody's comedy, but I approve of their, you know, their right to get up there and do it. That's right. I don't, I don't have to like every no. comic out there. If I don't like them, I just don't listen. I'll go find another one. Yeah, exactly. So, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm hoping that it is someday the pendulum swings back and the comics are allowed to be comics again. I, I think you're going to see it. I, I think um, Dave Chappelle kind of kicked it off. Yep. And um, other comedians are starting to say, you know what? Yeah, I don't need to be censored like that. And um, I think you're going to see a big turnaround. And Lord, I hope so. I would hate to be starting comedy. I mean, I had a very clean act. But, you know, again, we talked about this off the air. When I worked in radio, they tell you, it's not what you said. It's not what they heard. It's what they thought they heard. Mm -hmm. They could take offense by just interpreting what you said in a way you didn't intend it at all. And that, that's, you know, that, that just kills comedy. I mean, it's, you know, I had more than one comedian say, Frank, no, it was actually an anti-racist joke, but they took it as a race. Uh, believe me, I had something that was supposed to be anti-racist on my, my Facebook page. And because it mentioned that uh, mustache fella from World War II um, in the in the little meme, my whole page got taken down. Oh, oh yeah. I mean, you're talking ten years of memories and pictures and things, and this was supposed to be an anti-racist remark and anti-Nazi remark. And my whole page got taken down for it. Yeah, it's not what you post. It's not what you, <laughs> not what you post. Not what they thought you post. It's what they thought you posted. Yeah. Mm hmm. Yep. You know, I never thought I would see the day that I'm arguing with um, the younger generation about that whole thing at the Oscars with the uh, with Chris Rock and Will Smith. You know, was it uh, was it a tasteless joke? I guess, but it was supposed to be funny. You can't laugh at yourself or something like that. Yes, you know? and if if you watch very carefully, the audience's laugh at the joke. He compared her to Demi Moore at her hottest. Mm -hmm. And and the linchpin for me was Will Smith was laughing at the joke until he he looked at his wife and she gave him the stink eye. Mm -hmm. That's when yeah. So I thought Chris Rock handled it remarkably well you know he just took it and like well you just hit me i mean how many guys <laughs> how many guys just go you just hit me i wouldn't have gone you just although will smith did star in the biopic of ali so that was my first thought why'd you slap him you were ali in the movie you you can't throw a right <laughs> right <laughs> come on man you know float like a butterfly sting like a bee i mean you must have taken some boxing lessons to do that movie and somebody should have slapped him for doing Wild Wild West. So, oh. you know. <laughs> or yeah. there's another one, uh, something man, Gemini Man, or something. Uh, no, that was all right. There's another one, though. The uh, oh, I am. there was one he did with his son, and it was awful. Oh, yeah, what it was called, but you know, it, okay, it, if it really bothered her, then you say something maybe later on and say hey you know she didn't like it or whatever i think he, you should apologize yeah i'm sure he probably would have no oh, problem yeah. but you know somebody said well what if that had been your daughter well my daughter's a little tougher than that so and you she know, would have taken it but alopecia is not leukemia she's not dying she looks great even with her head shaved thank you, know? you. Yeah, I mean, it's, and you know, half the population loses hair for one reason or another in their lifetime. It's not anything to be ashamed of. And, and she's just, I think it's just gorgeous. Um, so, yeah, yeah, it seemed, like I said, he was laughing at it until he looked at her and she gave him a stink eye. And so I guess he felt like he had to, you know, 
most everything I've seen her in, she's got short hair. So, yeah, I would have taken Chris out of the look. Listen, I think you owe Jada an apology. I said, I understand why you did the joke and I get it and I laughed at it, but I think, you know, Jada didn't take it very well. So if you don't mind, I'm sure he would have done that. Yeah. And no problem. <laughs> Absolutely. But, I mean, she's the one that got on social media just the day or two before and was saying, ah, oh, yeah, I shaved my head. So what? I don't care. Okay. Yeah, and they, they got an open marriage. She's probably sleeping with some other guy right now. So, oh my God. That's a whole nother discussion. Oh, yeah, so. A can of worms. Uh, and Chris Rock's ticket sales went through the roof after that, by the way. They were kind of slow before for his mm -hmm. first concert back. And next thing you know, he's selling out. You know, and I'm, I'm not really big into social media but i i do have a tiktok account i'll i'll put clips of my shows on there just yeah. to, to get it out there and sometimes people will follow me and i'll check out their page to see if i'll follow them back and chris rock popped up as one of my uh suggested accounts and it was, he still had like three million followers on there <laughs> no you know, i think he did he again he you know, if somebody slapped you on international television, <laughs> I would have been tempted to, you know, to swing back. Uh, and he, he just, I don't know if he thought there was just so, supposed to be a joke or whatever. He, he still handled himself like a gentleman. I'll give it to him. I'll give yeah. it to him. You know, yeah, I say it's, you got to learn to laugh at yourself. And I think that was too far when you've, I, you've started a trend because I've seen some rapper got up because he was mad at a lady comic for something she said and took the micro microphone away from her. I'm like, <laughs> what kind of precedent are we setting here? <laughs> I mean, come on. If you don't yeah. like the comic, get up and leave. Yeah, get up and leave. Go to the box office, get your money back. You know, it's, uh, yeah, it's, <laughs> we just, you know, we've lived too long, man. I think it's time to, you know, <laughs> <laughs> yeah i'm ready for the aliens to come and kidnap me and take me away so you know anytime come on down and get me yeah sad to say um when they were talking before, at the beginning of the ukrainian thing you know putin's rattling his saber and talking about nukes and i'm thinking no I'm 65 lived a good <laughs> life if i go out going out in a flash is not a bad way to go and rather than just on some sort of you know decline to lose all your bodily functions i mean okay hey if i find out that they're going to bomb all those uh plants down around houston i can always go back and visit family hey good <laughs> to see you probably not let's uh, let i'm gonna go ahead and have them chicken and dumplings this time <laughs> yeah man and uh and, and some of that scotch would be good biscuits That's... and gravy fried chicken you name it i'm eating yes it. it's, it's back on my diet again <laughs> <laughs> really yeah well you know what when i'm on a plane um i had a woman sitting next to me on a plane I, i'm not i don't eat a lot of red meat but i eat other forms of, of you know meat and uh and the woman next to me on a plane was giving me a hard time by drinking a diet a real diet coke she goes you know there's aspartame in there that'll kill you i said honey i've had two aortic valve replacements a double bypass, a heart attack. I've got three stents. I live with major depressive disorder and chronic suicidal ideation. We're flying at 35,000 feet in a metal tube, violating the law of gravity. If, if, if aspartame is going to kill me, it's going to have to fucking get in line. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about dropping the F-bomb. Hey, no, no problem. Hey, that's what I say. I've given up everything else. Dr. Dr. Pepper, man. It's came out with zero sugar. That's if this is the worst thing that I'm drinking, more yeah. power to me. I, you know, I used to drink Dr. Pepper in high school because I'd come back to the school after lunch. Let me have a sip of that. It's Dr. Pepper. Oh, no. Nobody, nobody liked Dr. Pepper. So I, that way I never had to share it. Man, I don't, was, don't say that in Georgia. I love Dr. Pepper. <laughs> and I didn't know they came out with zero sugar. So I'll be. Yes. I'll be, Picking up a case at the store this week. You know, we actually, there's a town here in Texas that they make Dr. Pepper and they have a Dr. Pepper store. I bought Dr. Pepper cake mix there. <laughs> I kid you not. You can make cake with Dr. Pepper. Sounds good. I, I can't eat it, but I can make it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's, uh, yeah. It's well, you know, it's, it's one of those things not everybody likes. 
Hey, I love Dr. Pepper. It's the original oh. taste that I love so. Yep. <laughs> Ten, you remember this? 10, 2, and 4. Yes. And you know why that's on the bottle? No. Because back then, supposedly doctors recommended those were that it was those were the times that you were supposed to drink it. Oh. For whatever reason, I don't know. That's the same, probably the same doctors that says these are the brand cigarettes that you yeah, should smoke. Chesterfields, doctor recommend. <laughs> Hey, why not? The Flintstones used to advertise cigarettes, so. Really? Yeah. Do you know that? They used to have commercials with Fred Flintstone and Barney while they're, this was the commercial. They would sit there and they would have this smoke and they're watching Wilma mow the yard. Kid you not. Look it up. <laughs> That's great. I've watched too much television as a child. That's Yes, I as did I, and we've lived too long. Well yeah. past our best if used by dates. Yeah. Well, I figure my wife and I have now, she couldn't do no better. So I'm all right. <laughs> That's, uh, <laughs> thank, God, thank God for low self-esteem, huh? That's right. <laughs> that. And see, the best conversations are when you, you think that you're, you're done. You know, yeah. I never want people to go just like when you call somebody on the phone and you hadn't really said anything. And then when you get ready to leave to say goodbye, then you think of a hundred million things you could talk about. Well, let's be honest with the audience. Are we still recording? No, we're still recording. Okay. Let's be honest with the audience for a minute here. Before we got on the air, um, he told me he's been, he's been spending all day with his two-year-old grandson. So he's really looking forward to adult conversation and he might not let me go. And that's the truth. <laughs> that's the truth. <laughs> what can I say? <laughs> well, in radio, and I did a little bit, they always tell you, you need to live your life online. You need to let people know things like that. You know, they want to know, they want to know a little, little peek behind the curtain, you know? Yeah. Well, I was always told I'd be the best looking guy on radio. So. And I was told I got a voice for print. <laughs> <laughs> all right one more time <laughs> what is that website <laughs> it's the mental health comedian.com all right everybody thank you for joining us i appreciate you putting up with me and uh and if you're new to the channel thank you for stopping by and please subscribe um, if you're a regular thank you for your support uh check and make sure you still subscribe uh for some reason, uh, I know YouTube, they do some kind of audit and they will take subscribers away from you and I have no idea why they do that, but it's, let me do, can I do a little comedy club thing here? Sure. Go for it. Okay. Here's the deal. If you enjoyed the show, please tell your friends and subscribe. If you didn't enjoy the show, we hope you have no friends. <laughs> <Ba -dum> <laughs> well, like I said, thank you for coming. Uh, thank you, Mr. King. I appreciate yes, your time. And until the next one, everyone, please take care. Be kind to one another. God bless and peace. We hope you enjoyed this episode of Listen to the Vibes. You can catch us on Buzzsprout or wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts. And on YouTube. Follow us on Facebook at The Vibes Broadcast Network.